But that in the lake had a bewildering richness about it that enchanted the eye and held it with a stronger fascination. We sat absorbed and motionless through four long hours. We never thought of supper and never felt fatigue. But at 11 o'clock, the, confl conflagra the conflagration had traveled beyond our range of vision, and then darkness stole it down upon the landscape again. Hunger asserted itself now, but there was nothing to eat. The provisions were all cooked, no doubt, but we did not go to sea. We were homeless wanderers again, without any property. Our fence was gone, our house burned down, no insurance. Our pine forest was well scorched, the dead trees all burned up, and our broad acres of manzanita swept away. Our blankets were on our usual sand bed, however, and so we lay down and went to sleep. The next morning we started back to the old camp, but while out a long way from shore, so great a storm came up that we dared not try to land. So I bailed out the seas we shipped, and Johnny pulled heavily through the billows till we had reached a point three or four miles beyond the camp. The storm was increasing, and it became evident that it was better to take the hazard of beaching the boat than go down in a hundred fathoms of water. So we ran in, with tall white caps following, and I sat down in the stern sheets and pointed her head onto the shore. The instant the bow struck, a wave came over the stern that washed crew and cargo ashore and saved a deal of trouble. We shivered in the lee of a boulder all the rest of the day and froze all the night through. In the morning, the tempest had gone down and we paddled down to the camp without any unnecessary delay. We were so starved that we ate up the rest of the brigade's provisions and then set out to Carson to tell them about it and ask their forgiveness. It was accorded upon payment of damages. We made many trips to the lake after that and had many a hairbreadth escape and blood-curdling adventure which will never be recorded in any history. Chapter 24 Resolved to buy a horse Horsemanship in Carson A temptation Advice given me freely I buy the Mexican plug my first ride, a good bucker, I loan the plug, experience of borrowers, attempts to sell, expense of the experiment, a stranger taken in. I resolved to have a horse to ride. I had never seen such wild, free, magnificent horsemanship outside of a circus as, this, as these picturesquely clad Mexicans, Californians, and Mexicanized Americans displayed in Carson streets every day. How they rode, leaning just gently forward out of the perpendicular, easy and nonchalant, with broad slouch hat, brim blown square up in front, the long riata swinging above the head. They swept through the town like the wind. The next minute they were only a sailing puff of dust on the far desert. If they trotted, they sat out gallantly and gracefully, and seemed part of the horse. Did not go jiggering up and down after the silly Miss Nancy fashion of the riding schools. I had quickly learned to tell a horse from a cow, and was full of anxiety to learn more. I was resolved to buy a horse. While the thought was rankling in my mind, the auctioneer came scurrying through the plaza on a black beast that had as many humps and corners on him as a dormitory, and was necessarily uncomely. But he was going, going at twenty-two, horse, saddle, and bridle at twenty-two dollars, gentlemen, and I could hardly resist. A man whom I do not did not know, he turned out to be the auctioneer's brother, noticed the wistful look in my eye, and observed that that was a very remarkable horse to be going at such a price, and added that the saddle alone was worth the money. It was a Spanish saddle with ponderous tapaderos and furnished with the ungainly sole leathering covering with the unspellable name. I said I had a half a notion to bid, 
Then this keen-eyed person appeared to me to be taking my measure, but I dismissed the suspicion when he spoke, for his manner was full of guileless candor and truthfulness. Said he, I know that horse. Know him well. You are a stranger, I take it, and so you might think he was an American horse, maybe, but I assure you he is not. He is nothing of the kind, excuse my speaking in a low voice, other people being near. He is, without the shadow of a doubt, a genuine Mexican plug. I did not know what a genuine Mexican plug was, but there was something about this man's way of saying it that made me swear inward inwardly that I would own a genuine Mexican plug or die. Has he any other air advantages, I inquired, pressing what eagerness I could. He hooked his forefinger in the pocket of my arm sh army shirt, led me to one side and breathed in my ear impressively these words. He can outbuck anything in America. Going, 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 at twenty four dollars and a half. Jen, twenty seven, I shouted in a frenzy. And sold, said the auctioneer, and passed over the genuine Mexican plug to me. I could scarcely contain my exultation. I paid the money and put the animal in a neighboring livery stable to dine and rest himself. In the afternoon, I brought the creature into the plaza, and certain citizens held him by the head, and others by the tail while I mounted him. As soon as they let go, he placed all his feet in a bunch together, lowered his back, and then suddenly arched it upward, and shot me straight into the air, a matter of three or four feet. I came straight down again, lit in the saddle, went instantly up again, came down almost on the high pommel, shot up again, and came down on the horse's neck, all in the space of three or four seconds. Then he rose and stood almost straight up on his hind feet, and I, clasping his lean neck desperately, slid back into the saddle and held on. He came down and immediately hoisted his heels into the air, delivering a vicious kick to the, at the sky and stood on his forefeet. And then down he came once more and began the original exercise of shooting me straight up again. The third time I went up, I heard a stranger say, Oh, don't he buck, though. While I was up, somebody struck the horse a sounding thwack with a leathern strap, and when I arrived again, the genuine Mexican plug was not there. A Californian youth chased him up and caught him and asked if he might have a ride. I granted him that luxury. He mounted the genuine, got lifted into the air once, but sent his spurs home as he descended, and the horse darted away like a telegram. He soared over three fences like a bird and disappeared on the road toward the Washu Valley. I sat down on a stone with a sigh, and by a natural impulse, one of my hands sought my forehead, and the other the base of my stomach. I believe I never appreciated till then the poverty of the human machinery, for I still needed a hand or two to place elsewhere. Pen cannot describe how I was jolted up. Imagination cannot conceive how disjointed I was, how internally, externally, and universally I was unsettled, mixed up, and ruptured. There was a sympathetic crowd around me, though. One elderly-looking comforter said, Stranger, you've been taken in. Everybody in this camp knows that horse. Any child, any engine could have told you that he'd buck. He is the very worst devil to buck on the continent of America. You hear me? I'm Curry. Old Curry. Old Abe Curry. And moreover, he is a Simon Pure, out-and-out, out, genuine, damned Mexican plug, and an uncommon mean one at that, too. Why, you turn up if you had laid low and kept dark, there's chances to buy an American horse for mighty little more than you paid for that bloody old foreign relic. I gave no sign, but I made up my mind that if the auctioneer's brother's funeral took place while I was in the territory, I would postpone all other recreations and attend it. 
After a gallop of 16 miles, the Californian youth and the genuine Mexican plug came tearing into town again, shedding foam flakes like the spume spray that drives before a typhoon, and with one final skip over a wheelbarrow and a Chinaman cast anchor in front of the ranch. Such panting and blowing, such spreading and contracting of the red equine nostrils and glary of the wild equine eye. But was the imperial beast subjugated? Indeed, he was not. His lordship, the speaker of the house, thought he was, and mounted him to go down to the capital. But the first dash the creature made was over a pile of telegraph poles half as high as a church, and his time to the capital, one mile and three quarters, remains unbeaten to this day. But then he took an advantage. He left out the mile and only did the, th the three quarters. That is to say, he made a straight cut across lots, preferring fences and ditches to a crooked road. And when the speaker got to the capital, he said he had been in the air so much he felt as if he had made the trip on a comet. In the evening, the speaker came home afoot for exercise and got the genuine towed back behind a quartz wagon. The next day, I loaned the animal to the clerk of the house to go down to the Dana Silver Mine, six miles, and he walked back for exercise and got the horse towed. Everybody I loaned him to always walked back. They never could get enough exercise any other way. Still, I continued to loan him to anybody who was willing to borrow him, my idea being to get him crippled and throw him on the borrower's hands, or killed and make the borrower pay for him. But somehow, nothing ever happened to him. He took chances that no other horse ever took and survived, but he always came out safe. It was his daily habit to try experiments that had always before been considered impossible, but he always got through. Sometimes he miscalculated a little and did not get his rider through intact, but he always got through himself. Of course, I had tried to sell him, but that was a stretch of simplicity, which met with little sympathy. The auctioneer stormed up and down the streets on him for four days, dispersing the populace, interrupting business and destroying children, and never got a bid, at least never any but the $18 one he hired and notoriously substanceless bummer to make. The people only smiled pleasantly and restrained their desire to buy if they had any. Then the auctioneer brought in his bill and I withdrew the horse from the market. We tried to trade him off at private vendue next, offering him at a sacrifice for second-hand tombstones, old iron, temperance tracks, any kind of property. But holders were stiff and we retired from the market again. I never tried to ride the horse anymore. Walking was good enough exercise for a man like me. That had nothing the matter with him except ruptures, internal injuries, and such things. Finally, I tried to give him away, but it was a failure. Parties said earthquakes were ha handy enough on the Pacific coast. They did not wish to own one. As a last resort, I offered him to the governor for the use of the brigade. His face lit up eagerly at first, but toned down again and said the thing would be too palpable. Just then the livery stable man brought in his bill.